Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and today I'm going to take you through yeast and cancer. And no, that's not that yeast infections can cause cancer, that is that we could research yeast to get a better understanding of cancer. Um, so, and literally, this research started in baker's yeast, the kind of yeast you could buy from the supermarket, and the discoveries made in the, these yeast cells that you can get from the supermarket were critical in our understanding of complicated diseases like glioma, which is a cancer of the brain, which we can see growing here in this MRI here. Right, so let's jump into it. Now, first, let's get a, a context for this yeast research. So cancer is a disease in which the cell cycle or cell death pathways are dysfunctional and or. So uh, when you can think about it, perhaps the cell cycle, um, the cell division cycle is overly switched on. So we end up with more and more the cells dividing and dividing and dividing. And the cell death pathways that normally tell those cells to die, they are not needed, are, are not a dysfunctional too. So we end up with an invasive cell that's constantly dividing and refusing to die. And that's essentially what cancer is. It's a, a dysfunctional cell cycle and cell death process. So to understand that, we need to understand the cell cycle. Now, most of this was discovered using yeast research. And I'll go, I'll tell you the cycle, then I'll tell you the research that uh, uh, informed us of the cycle. So the first one is the GO phase. Now, GO means you're not in the cell cycle. <laughs> um, and most of your cells aren't in the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is cells dividing, but most of your cells are just sitting there doing their job. So your neurons aren't dividing and will never divide, they're just doing their job. But some cells are constantly dividing um, and so they enter the cell cycle. So the first decision is to leave the GO and enter the cell cycle. Now G stands for gap, um, and so this is just a gap in the cell cycle. Now, uh, you then head into the G1. Now, it's a bit confusing. Why is it called a gap? And it's because under the microscope, not a huge amount is happening. So we call it a gap, even though lots is happening. But from the perspective of a light microscope, not a huge amount is happening during this gap one cycle. So you go from GO to G1. Now, in the G1 phase, the cell is growing a bit, which is another good way to remember that it's the G phase. It is growing. And what's happening is the organelles and the stuff in the cytosol, in the cytoplasm, I should say, are duplicating. So the mitochondria are duplicating, we can see there, the mitochondria are duplicating, Golgi are duplicating, that kind of thing. It's getting ready to divide, it needs to duplicate kind of everything. Then we hit the S phase, I remember this by saying it's the synthesis phase, and it's where DNA is synthesized. So we need to duplicate our DNA, right? So we go from two sets of chromosomes to four sets of chromosomes. Um, so 46 chromosomes to 92. Um, so we end up full to the brim with chromosomes during the S phase. Then we go into the G2 phase. Now the G2 phase um, is basically the organizing phase, right? So you have to line up your chromosomes um, to make sure, and you check, the cell does a lot of checking to go, did I duplicate all the, all the DNA correctly? Have I lined up the chromosomes? Do I have each pair of chromosomes side by side, so four chromosomes all together? Um, all that kind of stuff. It's doing the checking and it's preparing for the division. Then we undergo the M phase, which stands for mitosis, so that's nice and easy um, because we know mitosis is cell division. And we undergo the regular cell division. And then we end up back here with a diploid cell, just two sets of chromosomes in that cell. Um, and now it can either go into the GO phase and just sit and do its job, or it can go back into the G1 phase and go round and round again, duplicating over and over again. Now, how do we discover this? Well, Dr. Harwell, um, an American scientist in the 70s, um, he discovered how all these phases work. Here he is drawing these diagrams, and he used baker's yeast. And he liked baker's yeast because they're eukaryote cells, similar to humans, they contain all the same things. And he proposed that because we share a common ancestor, yeast in humans, relatively recently as eukaryotes, and because cell division is such a fundamental thing to biology, that it won't have changed that much. You don't change things that are fundamental, right? We have DNA, yeast has DNA, cell division is gonna be very similar between us and yeast, right? So he proposed that uh, whatever we discover in yeast will be hugely applicable to humans. They divide very quickly, so it's a very convenient model to investigate cell division, right? They're constantly dividing, that's the perfect thing to do it in. And they're genetically manipulatable. Now, his tools that he had were very crude, as you're about to find out, and now we've got much more precision tools to do genetic engineering, 
but it's actually still applicable. Yeast is very easy to genetically engineer, much more so than human or animal cells. So uh, they are still a useful tool in research and still used today. So what does this experiment look like? This is a very broad, general um, uh, uh, description of his research. He took yeast and he grew it up. And then what he added was a, a mutagen that caused mutations in the DNA, uh, which is very clever, but he had no control over what mutations are happening. He would then take yeast cells and divide them out into different broths so that now they would each contain the same mutation in that broth, right? So they take that, there's a whole bunch of yeast cells all with different mutations. If you subsample them, you then end up with a pure strain, each with a unique mutation. And you can then look at what's going on in that mutation just under a light microscope to guess what the function of that mutation that's just occurred does in the yeast cell. And what he discovered was when you get mutations in certain genes that produce certain proteins, you end up with very funny cells that can't go all the way through the cell cycle. And he called these genes that produce proteins cyclins. So the name of the proteins are cyclins. Now there's loads of different cyclins, uh, but here's just some examples of them. Um, and they're indicated by letters. I don't, exp I don't think it's valuable learning these letters but it is valuable learning the fundamental principles of cyclins, the group of proteins. And they are called molecular checkpoints. So normally, uh, for example, there is no cyclin D expressed in a non-dividing cell. So in a cell in the geophase, there is no cyclin D expressed. But then you turn on that gene, you end up with cyclin D expression, and that will signal to the cell to enter the G1 phase, right? So it tells the cell to enter the G1 phase of the cell cycle. You can immediately see how important that discovery is for cancer, right? Cancer um, often just sits in the, the cell cycle. It never drops out into that GO phase. It's always going round and round that cell cycle, dividing and dividing and dividing. So it seems to, it is likely that many cancers are expressing, constantly expressing cyclin D because it's constantly turned on, allowing the cells to go around and around and never entering that GO phase. So that's a molecular checkpoint. When that switch goes on, it goes from the GO to the G1 phase. Um, then there's more molecular switches. E gets turned on to go from the G1 to the S phase. A gets turned on to go from the S to the G phase. B gets turned on to go from the, G to the G2 to the M phase. Don't learn those letters, but it is interesting to know that there's just sort of a cyclin, which is a checkpoint for each of the phases going around the cell cycle. So how did um, his experiment tell him that kind of information. Well, it might look something like this. Um, in the cell that had a mutation in cyclin D, so the cyclin D is now not functional because it's been mutated such that it doesn't work, the cells wouldn't divide, right? So in a cyclin D mutation, the cells wouldn't divide, so he took it off and it wouldn't even grow, right? It wouldn't leave the GO phase. So that's super interesting and he immediately understands what that checkpoint does. Um, and you might go, well, how did he investigate it? He can then breed it with a cell that has an active uh, uh, cyclin D and then look at what's happening to the progeny and stuff like that. So um, there, there are ways around complications where you're preventing the cell cycle from happening. So how would they even grow? Okay, and it's through breeding. But anyway, it's very complicated. So there was recombination. Um, if you have a mutation in cyclin E, it will keep going through the G1 phase, dividing its mitochondria, dividing its Golgi, and it will never duplicate its DNA. So it will never go on to that S phase. And so you can end up with really big cells full of cytoplasm. If you have a mutation in the A phase, it could potentially uh, keep replicating the DNA without ever going on into the G2 phase. So you might end up with uh, a diploid cell going to quadruploid cell, going to octoploid cell, as you end up with more and more sets of chromosomes occurring. Um, and if you've got a mutation in B, you, you don't get that organization happening, so you don't get that transition from G2 to the M phase. So it will just sit there with two with four sets of chromosomes, and it will never do the organizing in the checkpoints and go on to mitosis. So this is how Hartwell discovered these genes by doing random mutations, looking at the morphology pretty much under a light microscope the whole time, and he made fundamental discoveries that are critical to our understanding of cancer and cell cycle biology. Amazing stuff, Nobel Prize winning stuff. So um, 
Up next, I'm gonna take you through color metric assays. And I'm gonna be drawing those out because I find with methods, it's easier to draw them out.